Well, um, I guess maybe I should uh, lead off, Elisa. We didn't rehearse this, but um, I'm going to basically uh, do a, sh a very short introduction, uh, and then uh, Elisa is going to be, you know, give the, the bulk of the presentation. So um, I guess the uh, uh, title of this uh, event is Reparative Interpretation, Reparative Description, and the Drexel Family Digital Archive. Um, and uh, so I wanted to just give a little bit of uh, background uh, about this in, in terms of, first of all, just the concept of reparative description uh, in, in the context of the archival community, and then um, talk a bit about um, how the work that Elisa has been doing on this with regard to the Drexel Family Digital Archive, how that fits in uh, with um, you know, what we've been trying to do a little bit more broadly in, in Drexel University Archives. Um, so uh, the Society of American Archivists defines reparative description as, quote, remediation of practices or data that exclude, silence, harm, or mischaracterize marginalized people in the data created or used by archivists to identify or characterize archival resources, All right? So um, this is a, a, a concept, uh, you know, the repetitive description concept is basically a recognition that the finding aids and collection guides and catalog records that archivists uh, have been creating, and in some cases, we're still using, you know, guides that were created many decades ago, that too often these descriptive tools reflect biases and inequities that have been baked into society for, you know, generations. Um, and, you know, this is a... Um, an awareness that, you know, it, it, it to varying degrees is something that archivists have been grappling with for um, many years, but it's it's something that, you know, has certainly accelerated in recent years, largely in response to um, social protest movements, such as the Black Lives Matter movement, and and particularly in the, the uh, protests that um, followed the the murder of George Floyd in, in 2020, um, which is, you know, was kind of a turning point when DEI initiatives in a lot of contexts really um, just kind of gained a, a lot more momentum and, and, and support in, in all kinds of contexts. And so this is, you know, one, one little piece of that. Um, and, you know, at, at Drexel University Archives, um, Repaired description is something that um, is, you know, one major part of, you know, a number of different DEI related initiatives that that we've we've undertaken in, in, in various contexts in terms of, you know, trying to make archives, um, you know, more inclusive and welcoming and uh, respectful of, you know, uh, people from all communities. Um, in a lot of institutions, when people or when archivists talk about reparative description, they tend to focus on the, you know, correction of offensive or outdated language that, you know, may show up in uh, descriptive tools or um, what I think of as um, offensive euphemisms. So, for example, you know, referring to the mass imprisonment of Japanese Americans uh, uh, during World War II, referring to that as as internment. You know, that I, I would I would I would call that a, an offensive euphemism, right? Um, so, you know, those those kinds of changes in language are you know certainly something that you know we are mindful of, and that's sometimes an issue um, for us here, but I, I think something that uh, is a much bigger issue 
uh, in Drexel archives is just when uh, certain groups and experiences don't get described at all. So it's, it's not necessarily that, um, you, you know, um, marginalized or underrepresented groups are, are getting described in offensive ways, it's just that they're not, not um, present in, in a way that's, that's meaningful. And, and um, you know, an example I often use is if you wanted to do research on the history of people with disabilities at Drexel, um, there's probably a number of collections, uh, you know, in university archives that would be helpful for this, but it would be extremely difficult to find them because the, the collections aren't described that way. You can't just, you know, go into the catalog or into, um, you know, archive space and, and key in disability and, you know, get a whole long list. You, you, you're really not going to, going to, come up with much. So, so that's one example of the, the, the kind of gaps and silences that, you know, reparative description is intended to uh, address. And, um, you know, so, so um, there, you know, as I said, there are a number of uh, steps that, you know, we've, we've been taking um, to try to address these kind of problems. Uh, just to give you one other example, um, um, a project uh, in reparative description that we uh, initiated um, last uh, fall uh, was taking a look at uh, the biographical reference collection that is one of our larger and more heavily used collections in, in the archives. And, you know, there are, there are files on many, many different people who've been part of the Drexel community over, over the decades. Uh, and there it's basically there's a there's a guide to this collection but it's basically just a list of names and so again if you for example wanted to research people um who are part of a particular ethnic group or um you know part of the lgbt communities um things like this it, it, it would really you couldn't do it unless you had specific names to start with and so we initiated a uh, project um to go through and add um, a number of kinds of additional uh, descriptive information, including uh, information about uh, whether people were members of, you know, particular underrepresented or marginalized uh, communities, so that um, that kind of research would be uh, something that would be a lot more feasible. Um, in terms of the Drexel family project specifically, um, it, it, there's a certain tension in, in, uh, inherent in, in the situation in that the Drexel Family Project, um, to put it bluntly, is a project that focuses on the history of a rich white family. And um, so um, it, 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 that doesn't mean it's a, a bad thing to do. I mean, it's, it's a family that has done a lot of interesting things. Um, and, um, you know, there's a lot there that's, that's worth studying and, and exploring further. But, um, you know, as I said, there's, there's a basic tension there. And during the, the first phase of um, that project, which was um, uh, spearheaded by um, Elisa's predecessor, Molly Reynolds, um, we had some initial conversation about this. And one step that, that Molly took to kind of you know, test the waters a little bit was in addition to having, you know, pages on the uh, Drexel family exhibit about various members of the family and the things that they've done, Molly also added some information about some of the employees of the family, specifically uh, the, the sort of the, the, the people who worked in the home. So the, the, uh, the nannies and the drivers and the uh, house cleaners and, and folks like this who, um, you know, weren't members of the, the Drexel family, but who were very intimately connected with um, the, the family and, and its experiences. And um, uh, she was able to um, include some useful tidbits of information uh, about a few of these folks. Uh, in the uh, initial version of the, the Drexel family uh, exhibit. Um, 
And then when we got some additional funding uh, for uh, the, the Drexel Family Project and um, were able to think about doing, you know, kind of a, 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 a part two of the project, we uh, decided that it made sense to have reparative description be a major focus of the project. And we said, you know, you know, yes, this is a, it's a project that focuses on a rich white family, but there are many different ways that you can approach that history or that, you know, those histories. And so uh, we can talk about, you know, some of the underrepresented members of that family women uh, who often, you know, have, you know, not gotten the kind of attention that, you know, their husbands and brothers and, and fathers have gotten, even though there's a number of women within the Drexel family uh, who've done some pretty interesting things. Um, and then also looking more broadly at other folks who the uh, Drexels interacted with over the, the decades um, within their homes, in their um, uh, community activities and you know their 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 civic activities, in their travels around the world, and uh, so there's a lot of um, interesting possibilities there to tell many different stories. Even though the Drexel family is the is the centerpiece, there's you know there's a lot more, and I think this is an example of you know how. Um, it, it, reparative description, it's not a, it's not a zero sum game. It's not it's like, well, we're going to tell this other story instead. It's saying, you know, there are multiple stories here and it's about, you know, adding uh, depth and, and, and richness in, in, in terms of, you know, having a more holistic approach to um, understanding and learning about the past. Um, and with that, I'm going to stop and turn it over to Elisa. I probably went over my time, so I apologize, but uh, I'll, I'll stop there. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Elisa Kraut. I've been working with the Drexel University Archives for five months now, since May. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, that was a really good setup. I think um, uh, <clears throat> I might might need to I might need to bounce around a little bit, and that's okay. Um, so I'm just going to dive right into it and hopefully we'll have time to, to cover everything, but yeah, so I was brought in specifically to add complexity and expand the story of the Drexel family digital archive, which already had, there was so much work put into, um, the site that existed, uh, but it was, you know, there was so much, uh, to do to just get it up to the, the, the more basic stories that um, there was a real opportunity now at this point to expand those stories to tell a much more, um, many more diverse kind of narrative. So let's first, let's talk about, you know, Matthew was talking about reparative description. I've got this term reparative interpretation, like what are those, um, what are the differences, what are the similarities? Uh, there we go, okay. So I've got this little graphic here that um, hopefully will illustrate a little bit about the difference between um, descriptive text and interpretive text. So here are our materials right there in the center, our big block, our blue block of materials. Um, and off, shooting off of both of the materials, we have um, the archivist side and we have sort of a curator historian type of side. And um, both of those groups of people are going to use research to inform how we understand materials, and then they're going to write about those materials. So on the archivist side, we uh, write about materials to describe them so that they can be found, okay? So they can be, they're accessible, and that people who say, I wanna find something about this or this person uh, or this topic, that they can find them. And that is descriptive text. And for archivists specifically, it's done according, you know, typically according to a standard. It, the format that it, that writing takes is typically a finding aid, um, which literally is a document that aids people in finding materials and information. Uh, and that that is sort of the, the format of descriptive text. Um, 
so you're just saying, what do I have here? What is here? What is in it? What are the content? What is the context of the creation of these materials? That's what descriptive text is supposed to do from the archival perspective. On the other side, uh, you have this curator historian view. And what that person is, what those people are doing, that group are doing, is they're taking the materials in order to sort of inform um, a larger story or a narrative of some kind, um, how these materials relate to each other, how they relate to a larger story. And that is interpretation. So that's the interpretive text. And the format that that text might take, could take, is like an exhibit or publishing something or a website, et cetera. Now, there's definitely gray areas and overlap between these two. Um, you know, if you're writing a label for an artifact or a piece of, you know, written material or, or a record, that might be more descriptive, right? It might feel like there's less interpretation going on, um, except not always. And on the other side, descriptive text in some ways is always interpretive. And that's because um, we are, you know, we all come with our own experiences and biases, and that, that informs how we understand materials, even a document. It, you know, it's going to be different. And what we put forth as the proper description might change depending on our own experiences and our own biases. So understanding that, understanding that, um, you know, we're not neutral canvases for this work, and that, that helps to, um, to sort of tackle that and address it <clears throat> so that we can um, try to be equitable in how we talk about materials. So we've got two different ways of doing it. There's definitely overlap um, and we're not neutral. That's the takeaway. <laughs> okay, next slide. Um, so now I'm going to talk about how I approached expanding the, some of the stories within uh, the Drexel Family Digital Archive. And I've created sort of this, this staged little idea of this iterative process of a default narrative. And then we go to an expanded narrative and then an expansive narrative. So this is just the language that I'm using to, to talk about this. <laughs> um, so our default narrative, that is again, as Matthew discussed, that is our typical um, wealthy white male head of household or white family, you know, of, with lots of wealth. Um, and but the white male head of household is the main character in this story, right? They're the the business owner. They're the they they're the one who drives the story. That's our default narrative, and that is what has been traditionally preserved. Um, not, of course, 100%, but to a large extent, that is more typical of what is preserved in our historical record. And it's important to identify where we can expand that um, and expand those stories to include more people that also are, are important and interesting. And so that's moving into our expanded narrative. <laughs> women, women exist. Um, Non-men people exist, and they are active participants in their own lives. So that's our expanded narrative. But wait, there's more. Um, you can move into this, this expansive narrative um, that can include stories that talk about people who weren't all, who, who were even less likely to be have their stories and histories preserved in the historical record, like working class people, non-white people, marginalized communities, et cetera, except that you know, those people still influence the lives of wealthy white people in any number of ways. So this is, I'm gonna just take you through one way that I did that. And if we have time, we'll do a second one. Okay, here we go. Here's our default narrative. Our, our excellent, very excellent Anthony J. Drexel. We know him, we love him. He founded our institution that we're sitting in right now. Um, he is this, he is, he is the, the main character in this default story, okay? He is a partner in Drexel & Co., the, the bank that his father founded, Francis M. Drexel. Um, he also, you know, founded the Drexel Institute. He had um, eight children, six of whom lived to adulthood. 
And he also, there were times when um, a relative, when a mother would die, um, sadly, and that he and his wife would take in some of their young relatives, some of these young children um, during the grieving process or, you know, so that's a lot of children. That is a very interesting kind of family dynamic. Um, and in one case, I'm gonna touch on specifically, we hear, see on the right, Francis A. Drexel, Anthony J. Drexel's brother. Um, there's another brother that hopefully I'll have time to mention later. But Francis A. Drexel, his, his first wife, Hannah Langstroth Drexel, she passed away um, while giving birth to their second daughter, Catherine Drexel, who now is commonly known as Saint Catherine Drexel. She was sainted in 2000. Um, so when his first wife died, Anthony J. Drexel and his wife took, took the children in while he was grieving and until he married his second wife. That's our default narrative. So let's explore how we can expand that story. Here they are. Um, here on the left, we have Ellen Rosette Drexel. That's Anthony J. Drexel's wife. She had eight children. Let's just like think about that for a second. <laughs> eight children, six of whom lived to adulthood, clearly um, infant and child death and maternal death was absolutely a part of the the lives of people in in the 18th in the 19th century um and you know sadly even today so let's acknowledge her part in raising in raising these children in creating this home and also in this this interesting thing about bringing in young children into their home if their mother has passed away so there in the middle we have Frances A. Drexel's first wife, Hannah Langstroth Drexel. Um, she's typically a footnote in this story, um, even though it does appear that her parents and her family, even after her death, that they did stay very involved in the, their daughter, in, in Hannah's daughter's lives. And that Catherine Drexel even, you know, maintained correspondence with relatives from that family throughout her life. So, it's important to include her uh, and not just let her be like a tiny little little footnote. Um, now we move on to the right. We have Emma Mary Bouvier Drexel. She's Francis A. Drexel's second wife. Um, she brings Catholicism back into the family and they, her whole family, Francis A. Drexel's whole family is very devoutly Catholic. Um, that obviously influences the, the daughters very much who are very staunchly Catholic for their whole lives, and of course, definitely must influence Catherine Drexel, creating her own, um, founding her own religious order, the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament, and um, eventually, you know, then being sainted. One other interesting thing about Emma's story that's important to include is that she was a real believer in direct giving, and she was known to open up her house on certain days of the week regularly and would give money to uh, women and families in need. And she gave up to $20,000 a year doing this for a number of years, which is really quite extraordinary. Okay, so how can we blow that story up even further? So for this, we're gonna go and look at what the old site looked like for a second. So this is the old site from 2020. Um, this is just one page here that I just want to talk about for a second because it really is part of what inspired me to um, in, into the next story that we're going to talk about and how we do this expansive narrative on the next slide. So here we say it's the west of the Sulu River page. It's talking about the Drexel colony, which was Anthony J. Drexel. He, you know, decided he didn't want to be in the social center of Philadelphia in like the Rittenhouse neighborhood and instead decamps to West Philadelphia and builds his own home and then homes for like a lot of his relatives, you know, in, in the neighborhood that we're in today. Then if you scrolled all the way down, you would see this section who lived at 39th and Walnut, which was Anthony J. Drexel's home. And we have some very brief you know, but important information about some of the staff who lived in his home and worked there. 
this information is largely gathered from census data. And unfortunately, we haven't at this point been able to get any more um, more detailed information about this, these different you know, staff members. However, this is a real opportunity. You know, when I came in to um, revise the site and, and expand the site, I realized that what we should do is we should really um, highlight this kind of, of story. But since we can't find out that much more about these specific people who worked for Anthony J. Drexel and Ellen Rose at Drexel, I wondered if there was a, a direction to take it that would give us some more details. So I'm gonna click over, I hope this works. Hoping it's gonna open up, there we go. <laughs> there's the site. Um, yes, so there's the site as it exists now. And <clears throat> so here we have, um, sorry, look at it. So this is what it looks like now. Um, um, this is the- At least I think we're still seeing the same page. Oh, whoops. Yeah. Hold on. Okay, that's not working. That's okay. No problem. Here's a screenshot. I was hoping to take you to the live site. But here's a screenshot of what, um, of how I have modified that page. Of course, we still have all that information about the homes that Anthony J. Drexel and his family lived in around West Philadelphia, and we've really made that its own, heiress, you know, own page. And in, then we've also developed a new page that talks specifically about some of some staff members that we could get some more information about. These two women. Um, these two women, Johanna Ryan and Mary Bernadette Cassidy, they worked for Francis A. Drexel and Emma Bouvier Drexel. And they, they, they were really tasked with um, childcare and teaching for the three Drexel girls, Elizabeth, Catherine, and Louise. Um, and because so much has been written about Catherine Drexel, and so much of her documents were preserved, unlike Anthony J. Drexel, who destroyed his papers, um, there is a wealth of writing and also archival materials about Catherine Drexel and therefore Francis Drexel's home. Um, here on the left, Johanna Ryan, or as her young charge is called her, Jo, um, here we have her in, in her older years after she's you know, no longer working. But, but she was with the family since the children were very, very young, since Catherine was a baby and before Louise was even born, and stayed very, very close with the family until her death in 1906. So close, in fact, that she was buried in the cemetery of the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament. Um, so she, and, and then here in the middle, we have Mary Bernadette Cassidy, or as the girls called her Byrne <laughs> um, or Miss Cassidy. She was the girl's tutor. Now, Johanna lived with the family and traveled with them as their nursemaid, but Cassidy, um, she did not. She lived in Camden, New Jersey, and she, they were both Irish immigrants, but you may be able to tell from these photographs that they, they had different backgrounds. So even in this picture of Johanna in her older years. Um, I, we do know that she was more of a working class woman, um, of course, a very devout Catholic, but she was she was more of working class and less educated. Mary Bernadette Cassidy, on the other hand, was clearly from a, a more well-to-do background. And when they came to America, she had to work. Um, so there, there must have been a financial change in the family's you know, situation. But she was clearly educated, and she used that in, in her work as the girl's tutor. And since she didn't live and travel with the family, she would assign the girls assi writing assignments. So they'd be traveling Europe, through Europe, and then they would write these letters back, these essays back to, to Miss Cassidy, and they would describe 
all the things that were happening. So we have a really amazing record of, of what happened in their lives. These materials were from are from the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament papers at the Catholic Historical Research Center um, through the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. And we were lucky enough to go and look through some of those papers and they were you know, happy to let us post some on the site. So it really expands the story further and we can understand better the, the close relationship these women had in maintaining this wealthy lifestyle and you know how how this family lived on the right here just a little note is a this is a condolence letter that Francis A. Drexel wrote to Miss Cassidy on the occasion of her mother's death and while it's short and fairly formal there's a lot of warmth there and um, it does appear through other records as well that that the family was was very warm towards these women Um, that's not to say it was all perfect. If you go to the web, to the site, the Drexel Family Digital Archive site, um, you can see that also Emma would occasionally complain about workers in her diary. So it's, you know, not a hundred percent rosy. So that's how we created, we went from a default narrative to an expanded narrative and then an expansive narrative. Um, all right, I'm going to try to blast through the second one. <laughs> we'll see if we can. Um, so here is, we're gonna do this exercise again. So our default narrative, our expanded narrative, our expansive narrative. Default narrative is wealthy white men, leaders in their business, and they're, phil they're philanthropists, and, and then women are socialists, okay? So that's a very like basic, um, you know, not, it's a story that's not really examining like what does that really mean and is that really true so how can we expand that narrative we can expand that narrative by acknowledging and looking into where some of the women in these families also had very strong philanthropic ideals and how they use those to for the betterment of society you know we already talked about emma bouvier drexel and her direct giving of twenty thousand dollars a year at the time to to people in need so let's find another, you know, we'll we'll talk about another woman in the Drexel family who was also kind of, I mean, incredible. And then how do we create that narrative and make it expansive and really sort of start to examine some more complexity? We can do that by talking about how the wealthy engage with other cultures and those around them who are di of different classes than they are, um, and really start to use materials to, to kind of posit the question like who who is respected in their way of life and who is allowed to thrive, you know, aside from these very wealthy white families. So that's our track we're gonna take. Here again, we have a comparison all on one page now. Um, this on the left here is the original page from the original site in 2020, business, fortune, and philanthropy. Um, What's interesting about this is it actually doesn't talk about philanthropy very much. And I think it what it's doing is sort of setting up um, Anthony J. Drexel's founding of Drexel, the Drexel Institute of Art, Science and Industry as this, you know, his philanthropic legacy, which is certainly true. Uh, but it made me start to think about the opportunity to include more stories of philanthropic work in the family. So, of course, we keep this very important and interesting information about the found, you know, the early years of the Drexel family here in America and the founding of Drexel and Co., uh, the banking firm, and of course, also Anthony J. Drexel's founding of the Drexel Institute. But then on the right, I made a new page that specifically focused on philanthropy. And here we're able to talk about the non-Drexel Institute kind of initiatives of different family members, which include um, Joseph, the third brother, Joseph Drexel's donation of um, musical instruments to the Met, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, and then also he had a collection of 6,000 music uh, materials and manuscripts that were donated to um, it, they were donated to another repository, but it ended up merging with the New York Public Library. And 
that his collection became the foundation of the New York Public Library's um, sound, sound and music uh, division. So that's a big deal. But let's talk about Mary S. Eric Drexel for a moment. So this is Mary on the left. Um, this is in her later years. And she was married to Anthony J. Drexel's youngest son, um, George W. Childs Drexel. And they, you know, lived a, a very comfortable, very luxurious life. Um, but in her later years, she she got involved with um, volunteering with the Red Cross during World War I. I'm going to read this because I always get the title wrong. Um, between 1917 and 1919, she was the director of the American Red Cross Canteen Service for the Pennsylvania Delaware Division. Um, and we have this really incredible scrapbook where a lot of newspaper clippings document all that work that they did, with the canteen service. Um, and this is a clipping from that in the center, which I've blown up on the right. And according to newspaper, these newspaper articles, um, the division was seven, was 2,700 people, volunteers and, and workers. Um, so she was managing 2,700 people and that they fed 2,033,375 people during those, during that time um, related to the war effort. So, you know, that's pretty extraordinary, but of course there's more. So she was also a world traveler. Um, she traveled with uh, her husband and her nephew and several other people um, on their luxury steam yacht, the Alcido. And I really encourage you again, um, <laughs> I wish I could have gone to, I wish the live site thing was letting me look. Um, but, <clears throat> but we have a lot of great pictures uh, from their world travels while they were traveling on their yacht. Um, and we can learn some really interesting things about the family by looking into that. So. Um, Mary and George did not have children. I'm going to zoom in here and see her here. So there she is um, in the hat with the white feathers on the right. That's Mary. She's much younger there. And I, I'm not certain, but I believe George um, W. Child Strexel might be the one seated in the middle. But <clears throat> here they are on, on the Isle of Crete. Um, one of their many, many trips. They traveled to 44 different countries on some, during the course of several of these trips. Um, they were extre extremely long, more than a year sometimes. Um, and we have extensive photography from these trips. Their nephew, Livingston Biddle, took, um, uh, he was basically the documentarian for the trips. And there's just extraordinary photography from, from them. So some of the some of the photography is like this it sort of looks like, you know, we're we're seeing the local, the indigenous people, and they're recording some of, of that information in these handwritten captions. So this is a band which came to serenade them. Um, I believe this is from Indonesia. Uh, seven times in one afternoon. So clearly these kids were around a lot. And then added in pencil, it says, the bamboo instru instruments produce very melodic music. Um, and I was really interested to learn more about Mary during this time. And so unrelatedly, I was looking into our, we have a huge bank of scrapbooks that cover um, the Drexel family from Anthony J. Drexel's death in the 1890s up until 1980. So it's like many huge boxes of scrapbook materials. And I found this article about Mary S. Eric Drexel and a donation that she made to the Franklin Institute in 1938 of 127 non-Western musical instruments. And I was like, oh, that sounds pretty interesting. So I emailed them, the Franklin Institute, and it turns out that not too long after, you know, sometime in the 1940s, 
most of those instruments were transferred on a long-term loan to the Penn Museum, <laughs> um, which makes sense because I've never noticed a lot of musical instruments at the Franklin Institute. So I contacted the Penn Museum and they were able to confirm that that loan was made permanent in 2014, which is a really long time from the 1940s, but it's okay. Uh, and that they do have some of those materials through their digital um, collections repository. And so I was looking through it and here we go. I found these instruments that I'll show you the picture again. They look very like the instruments in that photograph. I don't know that they're the same, but um, it does look like that Mary was very interested in music and musical instruments and in collecting materials during their travels. And uh, then she shared them with the public. So here's that picture again. And here are those young children with that same set of instruments or similar. You know, really just such a fun story that we were able to share, which really expands what we know about um, the family and what their lives were like, and also their interaction with different cultures. So now we're gonna get, so that actually wasn't the expansive story. So the expansive story is how they're really dealing with um, how different members of the family, how they interact with different cultures and with the world around them. And while I was looking through all of these photographs from these incredible photo albums, I saw it, some images that kept repeating and they were pictures of members of the Drexel family being carried, carried around all these different countries that they were in. And typically it was Mary. So I'm gonna zoom in again. There she is with her fabulous parasol. Um, <laughs> I think this is Benin. Yes, this is in Benin. Um, that it says, the way Mrs. D, who's Mary S. Eric Drexel, traveled in Cotonou, which is in Benin, and also every other non-walker, which is implying that other people were carried. But most of the pictures show her. Um, then we had a couple of other photographs that were similar to this one. I'm going to zoom in again. Here is this child saying, are you taking a picture of me, weirdo? Um, but carrying the child, carrying another child, a younger child, possibly a sibling. This is in, <coughs> excuse me, this is in Karachi, um, listed as India, but now it's Pakistan. And the caption says, method of carrying babies which I thought was so interesting because it doesn't seem like even something to comment on really at this point. Um, but um, Anyway, I'm sorry, I was looking at the comment, forgive me. So I found this really interesting, especially in light of these other photographs where the family is constantly being carried around. So here's another one. This, I believe, is in Portugal. The location is not actually noted, but it's around other pictures that were listed as being in Portugal. So there's Mary again in a hammock being carried around. And I found this caption to be really quite sad, um, especially in how sort of perfunctory it is. It says, our party again, the hammock bearers are most expert, but owing to the strain on the heart, never lived to old age. So, you know, I, you know, he's even, in some way, uh, Livingston Biddle, the photographer, is, does understand that there's, there's a level of privilege here being carried around. Um, but then another discovery, I say discovery, but it was here in our records and it was described, so I was able to find it. So I wasn't, you know, it wasn't magic, but I found it. Somebody's work allowed me to find it. <laughs> But I did find this really interesting, um, a paper written in 1949 by an undergraduate student named Dorothy S. Holberson. And she did a, a short paper on the costume collection that she, that Mary S. Eric Drexel donated to what's now known as the Fox Collection, a lot of her clothing. And there's a lot of line drawings of the clothing. And I had originally been thinking maybe I could match some clothing to some of these photographs, which I have not been able to do because they're not really detailed enough to do that. Um, 
but actually the paper included an interview um, with the nephew Livingston Biddle, this photographer, and he talks about his aunt Mary um, and really talks about her as this very strong woman who was a force to be reckoned with. He talks about how she was an integral force and a, a leading force in all the plans for all these extensive yacht trips and figuring out the logistics for all these trips, which seems really amazing. It gives me heart palpitations just thinking of how complicated that would be. Um, and also talks about how she was involved with everything that they did. Um, so including hunting and fishing and that there was a, a game fishing expedition that they were on. And during that, she hurt her back um, and it caused her pain for the rest of her life, he says. And he mentions that she had to be carried around frequently on some of these trips and that she actually found it very embarrassing and was, was sort of so humiliated by it that at one point being carried around Jerusalem, he notes, she actually decided to go back to the ship because it was, she felt like she was being stared at and laughed at that. And I can't know that this is the same, but here is a picture of her being carried in Jerusalem. And you see the men are marked with, the, they have t-shirts or t-shirts, they have shirts that say cook, cooks porters. <clears throat> so it's very clear that something's happening as she's being carried around and that it's not norm, not typical. So I don't know that it's the same, but I found that so interesting, that addition, and it really added an extraordinary new context to this. Because of course, we're absolutely dealing with a story of profound privilege due to their wealth. Um, you know, most people were not traveling through the Middle East and the Far East and Southeast Asia and most of Africa at this time. Um, but there's this additional level to the story, which is a disability story. You know, she was finding ways to still be involved in her family's adventures and travels, even while she was dealing with um, some serious pain and mobility issues. So, uh, <laughs> you know, it was just such a such, such an interesting way to sort of to sort of tie up some of the loose ends of the story that I had actually been wondering about. Um, and so this is this is how, you know, I've really found found ways to expand these stories beyond what I'd even considered possible. Um, I, I'm sure we're we're getting close to being done. I want to give time for some questions, but I just really quickly I'm going to stop sharing and then share the site if I can figure out how to do that. Here we go. So here is just um, here's the Drexel exhibit site, and you click into here for our featured exhibit. Here's the new Drexel Family Digital Archive page, and on the right takes you to a lot of different. You know that's how you navigate through the the sections, and some of those sections have significant other information. For example, um, we didn't get to talk about talk about an exploded, expansive story. Um, St. Catherine Drexel, her sisters and Catholic education. There is a lot of content here and I encourage you to look through it. Um, it's really quite interesting. And the travel section is where you'll find information on the Alcido. And here we have the ship right here, the yacht. And you can jump to several different sections, including some amazing panoramas of Victoria Falls um, and you know other pictures, some of which I've just shown you, but I encourage you to, to pop over. And you can also look through the, all of the photo albums that are just excerpted here um, on the Drexel Digital Repository. Okay. Um, I guess if, if anybody has any questions. I'm keeping an eye on chat. If anyone has any questions, want, feel free to drop them in there.
Um, I will say that what I'm working on now, as you compose your questions, certainly jump out um, and catch me in the hallway. You know, I'm, I'm always here when I'm not in this locked room without any windows. Um, but right now I'm trying to work on some World War I and World War II stories about some of the, the Drexel family members, which some of which are, are much more well-known. Of course, Ambassador Biddle, um, who is ambas ambassador to seven or eight um, countries during during the war, their governments in exile in European countries, um, but also to the less well-known, such as um, one, one woman who was living in Paris and was a go-between between the, um, for the, the underground, the, the resistance movement during the Nazi occupation. So even as a very wealthy woman, you know, in some ways that may have given her more freedom to move around. So we're hoping to share those stories in the next few weeks. There's a comment from John Wiggins in the in the chat. I'll just read it. Uh, I learned so much from this event. Just wanted to share my sincere thanks for the stories and examples. Looking forward to digging into the site on my own. Thanks, Thanks John. so much. Thanks, John. <laughs> That's great. Um, and I'm just, it's really great that you all came. Thanks so much for listening to me prattle on. As anybody who's been around me in the last four months, uh, five months knows, I can really talk about this stuff. It's more getting me to stop talking about it. Talking about it. <laughs> That's hard. <laughs> Do you want to talk it talk about it to uh, an external audience too? I think this would be great for other members of the Drexel community, not just the library uh, oh, staff. Yeah. So. Yeah, happy to. Excellent. All right, mm -hmm. I will be in touch to ask you about that. <laughs> okay. I'll just note another comment in the chat from Jay, a photographic treasure. Thank you so much. I also learned enough, a lot. Um, that's Jay Bot. Thanks, Thanks Jay. Jay. Um, I, I wish I knew more about the technical aspects of the photography. I did a little bit of research, which we do include on the site that talks about some of the, the sort of handheld photography available at the time. Um, especially considering that they were made in a flexible panoramic format. So I talk a very little bit about that, but there's definitely opportunity to expand. Um, I will say I didn't show this to all of you, but one reason to go to the site is to look at the Victoria Falls photographs um, because they are these sepia-toned photographs, so there's no color there. But what you can see is the play of light across the landscape. And you can see that they're, there are rainbows there. You just, they're not in color. And that's really extraordinary. So I look, go, go, go to the site um, and, you know, zoom in, click into those photographs. Uh, you can, they're really amazing quality, the images. So you can see them pretty close. And, and if I could just add the um, Livingston Biddle's photograph albums from these voyages have been digitized in full and are fully available online. However, the online version, unless you have a really big screen, the online version is not going to do the originals justice. And if anyone is interested in looking at the originals, we have those downstairs at Hagerty and, you know, we'd be happy to pull them out and, and, and show them if, if you know, why not? You know, library staff members can be researchers too. You can come and take a look. Um, these were these were family heirlooms that were passed down through the family and were donated to the archives um, by Cordelia Biddle, um, who was Livingston Biddle's daughter, granddaughter, granddaughter. granddaughter. Yeah. Um, so anyway, we have them. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I also want to add that one of the other things we did was, as I've mentioned, we expanded the story to include some materials from other repositories and making relationships with other repositories, uh, which has been really, really fruitful. Um, we have a couple pictures from Xavier University, St. Catherine's, uh, her orders, the, they found the, the university, uh, Xavier University in New Orleans, which is the only Catholic HBCU. 
and is still around and is really quite a legacy uh, to to that order. Um, and also the, the Catholic Archdiocese was was very forthcoming. And of course, we had to get permission from the sisters, the remaining sisters of the Blessed Sacrament, in order to share some of the, the images from the, the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament papers. Um, but other places as well. Um, we've got something from the Free Library up there and, and several other repositories. And it's been it's been really nice to seek out other sources for the materials to help enrich what we have here. Um, and in terms of next steps, um, I mean, Elisa mentioned that there's additional content that we we uh, want to add, you know, are, are going to be adding to the Drexel family exhibit. Um, but we are also hoping to uh, launch a, a, a separate exhibit about um, it, it sort of reparative interpretation related to uh, the early history of the Drexel Institute, looking at some issues of race and ethnicity in particular in the early decades of the Drexel Institute. And so th there's this is something that um, Elisa did uh, a lot of the spade work for this. Um, it's also building on a lot of work that um, S Simon Ragerman has had done previously on the Drexel Institute history. And um, we have a, um, uh, CCI uh, capstone project uh, student who's going to be uh, doing some work on this uh, next quarter. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, seeing where, where we can go with that. And, and that also is building on uh, or incorporating some uh, materials from uh, other, other institutions that um, speak to our, our own history. Like the, like the Carlisle Indian Industrial School. Very exciting. Um, I mean, I think it's it's just about two o'clock. As I said, I'm, I can talk about this stuff forever, but um, are we, is, it, is this it? <laughs> <laughs> We've got a couple more chat comments, just a, a couple of thank yous. One from Becky, uh, talk gave great references and one from Jessica. Thanks for coming everyone. Um, uh, Jessica says thanks for the presentation as well. Um, and yeah, I think this will conclude our session. You know where to find Elisa. You know where to find us if you have any questions. I'll post the recording on the Hub um, and share it in staff news next week. So thank you all so much. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.